There we go. A true blockhead. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. So basically, this is exactly what we're going to do. Welcome back to Blender Frenzy. I'm Justin, and I'm really excited today because we are doing something other than toilet paper. Oh, I'm so bored with toilet paper, and I'm sure you guys are too. But Halloween is coming up, and I wanted to do something for that, and I've got um, a course on the way as well that uh, expounds upon what we're going to be talking about today. But today is all free, and we're going to learn how to put some zombie teeth on your face. So uh, open up Blender like this, and then... Come over here to add a workspace if you haven't already added a video editing workspace. You just come here and go down to video editing and video editing. And then you should see something that looks like this. And so you can add in your footage here. Um, I'm just going to hover my mouse over here. Shift A and then add in a movie. Head on over to your footage and add it in. Of course, if you don't have any footage, you're going to want to do that first. What you need to do is grab something to mark your face. Now, what I used is a little makeup crayon from a Halloween kit for face paint. Now, a Halloween kit or a makeup kit of some kind is the best because it's meant for the face and shouldn't cause too many problems. But if you don't have that, you could do something like a dry erase marker. Now, a lot of people suggest Sharpie, but Sharpie is permanent. And you need to be careful when putting stuff that's not meant for the skin onto the skin. So be careful with markers or anything like that. And of course, if you're allergic to anything, don't put that on your skin. But I found for myself, if I didn't have the Halloween makeup kit, I would use a dry erase marker because that comes off really easily. So what you want to do is make small points all around the face. Um, it doesn't really matter how many, just keep in mind that Blender needs at least eight trackers on the scene at all time. So if you're doing things like moving your head or turning your head, you got to keep that in mind. If you know that you're going to be showing one side of the face, you might want to put more markers on that side of the face. Now, Blender's pretty good at tracking small markers as long as they're high contrast, but don't make the markers too big because if they're too big, then we're going to have trouble removing them later. So once you're done with the markers, stand in front of camera, press record, and act like a zombie. So I've got my footage here, so I'm going to um, delete the bottom one here, which is the sound. I don't need the sound. And then I'm going to find the part of the footage that I want to keep because um, it's not this whole thing. <laughs> I did quite a few takes. I think I want something like this. So I went right before I turn my head like this. And then Shift S to snap it to the playhead. And then we're going to move this to, yeah, right about there. I think that's good. So it's like this handle and then Shift S, snap it there. And then I'm gonna drag this all the way to, uh, actually, you know what, I'm just gonna Shift left arrow and then shift s to snap and this is really important here i'm going to grab this up and move that up just a little bit so we can zoom in here uh, this is really important to have the footage start at frame one you'll run into problems with your tracking since we're going to be exporting an image sequence uh, it's going to start at frame one and then it will label them one to however many we have which in this case is seven seconds and 28 frames which we can change that if we do Control t um, you can also go to view and then show seconds Control t it's a toggle um, so 238 frames, which by the way, I'm going to hover my mouse over here and control end to make that the end frame. Now you can skip this step if you want to use the footage to actually track, but the reason I'm not doing that is because sometimes Blender actually adds frames into my footage for some reason. I have no idea why. So if you render out an image sequence in, in specific amount of frames, it I think it avoids doing that. So, okay, so we have our footage here and ready. Let's go over to rendering and then press F12. And we see this, hopefully. If you don't see this, we're gonna check a couple things. So uh, first thing we wanna do is come over to our output and down to post-processing. We wanna make sure sequencer is checked. Now I'm going to uncheck compositor. It doesn't really matter in this situation because as long as sequencer is checked, it will override anything else. And then let's go to output. I'm going to do double forward slash. Um, basically, um, we have a made a folder image sequence, a folder of zombie teeth background 01, and then that's another folder. And then inside that folder, we have ZT underscore background 
underscore 01, and then another underscore because we have file extensions checked, which we want, and then that's going to add our frames at the end plus the file extension. Now I'm going to uncheck overwrite. I'm going to make this a JPEG and 100%, and I'm going to save it, of course, and control F12, and then it's going to render out all of our frames. Now I can pull this up here. You can see our frame range here. If you can't see this full frame range, hover your mouse over here and then just press home. And then that will make sure that frame range is um, in your view. So we're almost finished here. Okay, so we're done with that. Now let's go to motion tracking. If you don't have a motion tracking, just go to the plus add workspace, VFX and motion tracking. So you should see something that looks similar to this. I don't need the top parts right now. I'm just gonna pull that all the way up. What we wanna do is open our clip. Just navigate to your image sequence folder. Again, zombie teeth background. Um, and just make sure that you have it sorted by name. If this is sorted by a different like date modified or um, size or whatever, it's, you're gonna, it's gonna be out of order. So just make sure you sort by name starting at one. Press A, select all of them, and open clip, and there we go. Oh, and you know what? Actually, I did, I forgot to do something. Um, let's go back to video editing, and I forgot that um, by default, Blender is set up to render color as filmic, which you want for realistic looking 3D objects. But since it's a video footage that we want to render, I actually want to change that to standard. I'm just going to re-render everything again. And the way you do that, let's go back to rendering. If you want to overwrite, of course, just check overwrite. See, right now, if I press Control F12, nothing's going to happen because everything is named the same and it's not going to overwrite anything. But if I check overwrite and then I Control F12, now it's going to overwrite everything. But we want that color space to be um, not filmic. We want it to be standard. So yeah, that's pretty fast there. So I'm going to do that. And then when we come over to motion tracking, um, where is, I'm just going to go to clip and reload clip. Aha, there we go. Perfect. That's better. Okay. So we've got our frame range here. I'm going to scroll out. I'm going to move this up. This is going to be our graph area. And then this is going to be our timeline, or I should say it is, it, it already is home and home. Oh, let's scroll back out there. Good. So we've got like three uh, different timelines here, um, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the beginning, prefetch those frames that'll load that into cache. I'm going to save it here, save another iteration, and we are ready to go. So this tutorial is mostly about the workflow of how to do this kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the camera tracking itself. Uh, I'll give you some tips, but um, there's plenty of tutorials out there for object tracking, which brings me to my first thing. The very first thing you want to do that I always forget, and I would have forgotten had I not just said object tracking, is come over to your track tab here, and under objects, you have a camera by default. That's what, if you start adding tracking markers, you're going to be doing camera motion. And that means the tracking markers stay still and your camera moves. But in this case, my camera is staying still and I am moving. And so that is an object. So we're going to add an object here and I'm just going to rename this head. There we go. So we want this selected, not the camera. So this selected, and then we can start adding tracking points. So before I do that, let's look over here. We've got a track tab on this side as well. For moving heads, I found that uh, the motion model, uh, affin, affine, 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 I have no idea how to pronounce that. And then keyframe are the best. I'm going to also click normalize here. And then all you have to do is find a marker and then control left click. And there we go. There's our first marker. And you can see over here, it is displayed in our track. If you don't have that open, just open that up. And then uh, you want to make sure this is square because our track is square. So just kind of drag that down. Now this is a little bit too small. So I'm going to press S to scale and we're going to scale that up a little bit, something like that. And then I'm going to go over here to clip display and turn on my search pattern. So we've got a search pattern. This is what Blender is going to use to search. And then we have what it's actually tracking in the smaller square. So with this resized and selected, I'm going to come over here and copy from track or active track. And then it gives our sizes here so that when we click the other ones, they will copy everything that we have here. Okay. So starting on frame one, I'm going to press control T to track. 
and see what it does. Okay, so we've got our first almost track, then it loses it at about 2.15 here. So I'm gonna, you can see it's kind of jittery. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have 2.15 be uh, our end frame. So over your timeline, control end. So let's take a look at this. What I like to do is after I track the first one, I like to drag it backwards and watch this over here. You can also hover your mouse over here, press L to lock and then scroll in. And then um, that just basically locks the footage to that tracker. So you don't have to keep moving your footage around. So I just kind of watch it. And so it's really smooth all the way in the beginning, all the way until about right here and where it starts jumping around. You can see that here in the footage, you can see that here, and you can also see the representation of it right here. This big motion here is our head turning, of course, so, which is something good, that's what we want. But then this here is not what we want. So I'm gonna go to the first frame before it starts doing all of the little crazy stuff, and then I'm just going to modify this just a bit. Now, I don't want to move it necessarily, but I'm just going to um, maybe scale it up just a tad bit. And what that does is it's going to create a keyframe. And then because we have a match keyframe here, it's going to try to match that keyframe tracking forward. So I'm just going to press Control T and see how it does this time. And you can see it smooths all of that out. And now we have a nice smooth track there. Great. So go back to frame one, scroll out here and move on to the next one. Now, I like to do these one at a time. You can do all of them at the same time if you want, but then when they get problems like that, if multiple have problems, you're gonna have to do one by one anyway. So might as well take care of it one at a time. At least that's my philosophy. So that's the gist of camera tracking. I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up so you, you're not bored watching me track every single marker, but I'll stop and explain a couple tips along the way. Actually, the first tip is that you can move the marker by clicking and dragging in this square. Um, I actually don't see a lot of people doing that. They come out here and they press G to grab and they try to move it there. And that works well enough, but you have a lot more control and finesse if you move, move it here. So you can do this and then press control T. And then this is a good example. If it stops like that, all you have to do, you don't have to come over here. You can just stay here, click and then drag and put that right back where it was. Put that thing back where it came from, or so help me, so help me. Now, after you move it, you might want to arrow back and forth to see how much that has moved, okay? So I want to actually try to match the previous frame as closely as possible. So here's where I moved it to. Here's where it was before. So I'm just going to move that slightly back over here and then just kind of go, yeah, so something like that, okay? And now let's see if we can control T. Yep, and perfect. Now, if it doesn't go then, you might want to, again, scale it up or scale it down. Maybe move these points here. You can actually move these points individually if you'd like. Any sort of change done to the marker will make a keyframe, and then it will look at that keyframe as a reference. So here's an example where, starting here, that marker is a little bit difficult for the tracker to read. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to disable that. And you can just disable it by finding like kind of where you want it to stop. And I think I think about right here, it's it's blurry enough to where we can get rid of anything afterwards. So um, that's what this button here is for. Clear track path. We've got clear tracks after or before. This one is after, and we just click that, and then it clears everything after the playhead. This button here does the same thing, except for it clears everything before the playhead. And now when we continue to play, it just stays there. Um, if you don't want to see the disabled markers, then you can come up to clip display and then uncheck show disabled, and then it will still be there. <laughs> and that's because it's selected. But if I uh, deselect everything or it's active, if you, if you make something else active, then that disappears. But I like to actually see those, so I'm going to keep that on. And let's go to the next one. Now you can also track backwards. Um, if I start down here and then I click this one, well actually let's start all the way. Shift, right arrow, goes to the end. And then line this up and uh, Control Shift T will go backwards. And it does the exact same thing except for it goes backwards. Now you get a lot of jittering here for some reason. 
Um, and that is not good at all. So we'll have to mess with that. But I generally don't like to track backwards uh, because what I do is, let's just undo that. What I do is after I'm done tracking uh, my last marker, which was this one, uh, I like to just scrub back and make sure that it's smooth. And then I start at the beginning again. So yeah, that's how I like to roll. So let's see if we can track this one and um, see tracking from the beginning as already 100 times better. Of course, I don't know if this is the one that I tracked. I don't know if it was this one or this one, but you can see uh, tracking from different points and different keyframes have different effects. Um, some are smoother and some are not as smooth, but that one's pretty smooth all the way until here. So again, we're just going to resize this. I'm going to resize the middle one or the inside one, and then I'm going to click and drag the search bar and or the search square rather and something like that. And then I'm going to finish tracking, control T, and that looks pretty smooth. So let's check and go back. And yeah. So if you do it like this, you're bound to get a very good track. And that's what we want is a very good track. So let's continue on. Okay, so we got another one on this side of the face that's going to be discontinued because you, it goes out of the frame. Basically, you can't see it when my head turns. And that's going to happen probably for uh, these two as well. I know it's probably going to happen for this one down here. Probably not this one. Actually, we can just see. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so this one is the only one that's really going to be able to stay. So a tip with this is um, don't just leave it like it is. So like sometimes it will go to the edge and then it will slide and it will keep going and it will sometimes it will go all the way to the end and it will just slide around the footage like up here in the hair or around the side of the face um just be careful with that so i like i said i always come back and find the last great track so see it starts to be really blurry here and starts to just go haywire um before it even loses the track so i'm gonna come back to here i think something like this right here 148 looks good i'm just going to clear everything after that so that uh everything after that doesn't mess up our track okay so with these last two markers over here on this side of the face uh, we have the same problem they go out of the screen here and then they come back in here now they're, they're they are here in the beginning and let's actually we can go ahead and try that um so let's uh add one here and let's just try to track that control T. Okay. So we lose it here. Um, but again, we want to kind of backtrack, make sure that we have a good track and it's pretty good all the way up until the end there, but then it's disabled of course, cause we don't see that marker anymore. And then it comes back here, move this one by pressing G and moving it here. And then you can also refine it by clicking and dragging here. And then that makes a new keyframe. And then you can just press Control T and continue on it's just like that. And then it'll be active in the beginning, disabled, and then active again. Okay, so we have got our tracking markers placed and tracked and look at this beautiful graph here. This is actually what it's supposed to look like um, where all of the markers are supposed to kind of flow together, the um, X and the Y. So the X is left and right, which is your red lines here. And then the Y is up and down, which are the green lines. Now you can see over here, we have some lines going straight down the middle, which in this case is okay, because if we come over here, you can see this is actually, if we just click this to enable only selected, we can see that that is the beginning to that marker. And over here, uh, we have that marker here being tracked until it goes out of the frame and then it's disabled and it comes back in right here. And that's why you see this line coming straight up because it always starts at the same point. And then from that same point, they both veer off, you know, up and down, left and right. Same thing with this one. If we click that one, you can see that that one actually comes in right here. And then they veer off and it ends here from the beginning. So these are okay. Uh, generally speaking, though, if you have a whole bunch of them that are kind of going crisscross and haywire, you might want to look into them. You might have some sliding going on here. Um, I don't know what, why this one is 
Is that? What? <laughs> I don't even remember tracking this back here. I must have done that accidentally. <laughs> okay, well, um, this is a cool way to see. Again, if you just select one of them, you can see just that graph if you have that selected, which is really cool. So I'm just, yeah, this one's like all the way over. Eh, eh, I don't know. And I don't know now. Oh, I must have added a, I must have moved it. Anyway, okay, I'm just going to delete the track. X to delete. And now we have our uh, trackers. Okay, next step is to solve this. So let's go to our solve panel here. And immediately I'm going to check a couple of things. So um, we have a keyframe here, A and B. This is going to be our point of motion uh, that is the most parallax, which uh, you can see is right here uh, between... 140 and 180. So I could set those to 140 and 180, but instead I'm actually just going to click keyframe and let Blender do it. Now this refine option is grayed out. Uh, if this is not grayed out, you can refine this. Now I don't think anything is going to happen if I choose this, but I like to refine focal length K1 and K2. Uh, I don't think, again, it's since it's grayed out, I don't think it's going to do it. But what that does is if you come over here to your lens, um, here's your K1, K2, K3. This is all about distortion. So we've got lens distortion and then our, your focal length. This will just refine and, and Blender will detect maybe what your focal length is. But Blender doesn't always do that for some reason. I don't know why. Um, again, if this is grayed out, then it probably won't do it. And then you'll have to kind of play around with this if you get a bad solve error. So let's go ahead and see what kind of solve error we get. I'm going to select all of them by pressing A and then solve object motion. And we have a solve error of 0 0.3882. Woohoo! I think that's my lowest yet. Maybe I maybe I did get a 0 0.34 earlier, but that is pretty good. You want at least under one. So if you get a solve error over one, then you're going to want to refine it. If you get a solve error of 200, you're really going to want to refine it. <clears throat> but here's a couple tips to refine that solve error if you're getting problems. Um, go ahead and go to clip display and then info and then it will show you the sol average solve error of each track and then you can find the ones that have the highest solve error an easier way to do that though is if we deselect everything and then come over here to clean up with the type select click clean tracks and since we have an error of zero it's not going to select any of them so if we open this up and make sure if you don't see this you can come to view and then adjust last operation make sure that's checked we want the reprojection error. We're just going to start sliding this up here. And you can see that this is the highest one here, I think. Scroll out and just see. Yeah. Oh, nope. The highest one is this one here. Average solve error is 0.823. So what is that one? So we can see we've got that selected. So we can see the graph here. And along with the red and green lines, now you see this blue line. This is our solve error. Basically, the, the straighter this is, the better your solve error is. So that is actually pretty straight. But just for demonstration purposes, what we can do is, um, let's see, what is this one? That's on the side of the face. I think we have enough trackers that we don't necessarily need that tracker. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that one. And then go back to the beginning, press A, and then we're going to solve that object motion again. And let's see if we can get it even lower. Okay, we got a little bit lower. So it was 0.388 before, now it's 0.3649. So that's even lower, um, but that's how you would do that. Um, and then you could just do it again, just clean tracks, reprojection error, and just keep moving this up. Oh, uh, th nothing's happening because they're already selected. So I've just, just deselect everything and then click clean tracks again. And then um, as you pull that up, you can see the ones that give you the highest reprojection error. Now you can see this one. Now if I delete this one, or maybe if I retract that, maybe if I move, um, you know, maybe if I find a spot that is, you know, really jittery, let's just say, okay, for sake of demonstration, this is really jittery. So what we can do is come over here, find out the range, of where that's jittering, probably, yeah, just right there. So 108 to about 120. So with our marker selected, I just press B to box select, and we're just gonna box select all the way until 120, and then Shift D to disable. 
So from here to here, it's disabled, and it comes back in right there. And uh, let's see if that actually uh, worked. Oh, and I accidentally have these selected. So uh, Alt-A, make sure nothing is selected first, and let's do that again. So what we had um, was at, starting at 108. Actually, I can probably even go later, maybe uh, 110 to 120. Yeah, just those 10 frames. So box select and shift D, we're just gonna disable those. All right, and let's see what we get. Solve object motion, 0.3638. So that's a little bit lower, but again, I'm just showing you techniques that you can do if your solve error is over one. But we've got a really good solve error now, so let's move to the next step. Okay, so the next step is to bring these 2D markers into 3D space. Let's go to our layout. I'm going to delete the default cube, select our camera, Alt-R, Alt-G, to clear the rotation and the location, rotate on the X90, enter, and then we're just gonna grab this on the Y and move that back, and then grab it on the Z and move that up just a little bit here. And you'll see why, because we want our markers kind of roughly hovering over the center of the grid. So with our camera selected, come over here to the constraints tab, add in a camera solver, which is the active clip and nothing happens. Well, that's not true, actually. Something did happen, we just have to enable it. So come over here and check motion tracking. And ta-da, there are the trackers. So if I go ahead and press play, well, let's bring this up here and go to frame one, press play. You can see our camera stays in one spot and our object is moving, which is our face, which is pretty cool. Um, these trackers are a little bit too big. So if we come back here and we can actually change these to display differently. We can display them as arrows, uh, circles, <laughs> cubes, spheres, uh, plane axes are okay. I'm just going to uh, drag this down so they're not as big. There we go. So something that like that. And you can see the shape of the face. Here's the nose and the sides of the face. So that's pretty cool. So to see this on top of the footage, we need to go into our camera mode by pressing zero. And then with our camera selected, of course, go to the camera properties and check background images, open that up, add an image, which it's not really an image, it's a movie clip. So we're gonna click movie clip and then choose our image sequence. Okay, so it's still a little bit transparent. We've got the alpha set to 0.5. I'm just gonna crank that up. And you can still see the grid, which is fine because uh, we have that in set to back. If I set that to front, then we're not going to be able to see our 3D markers um, very easily. So we're just going to select that to back. Okay, so if we press play, you can see, oh, look at that sweet, sweet track. And that looks really good. Um, so what you want to watch out for here, actually, the very first thing is um, if this doesn't line up, what you need to do, especially if you've checked um, refine here and it refined your focal length, check your focal length here. It's 24 millimeters. So if we come over to our camera and we look at our focal length here, our focal length is 24 millimeters. So we these need to match. OK, if they don't match, it's going to be off. Um, and I'll just show you that here. We look at that if, if I change. The focal length here, you can see that throws that off. And it will still play the animation and track accordingly, but of course, it needs to be the correct focal length. Same thing for the camera and the sensor. We've got the sensor size 35 millimeters. Just make sure that matches your camera here, 35 millimeter sensor width. Okay, so once you get everything lined up, what you need to look for is any sort of jumping. So here, I don't think we have any. And again, that is because we used an image sequence um, instead of our footage, which again, Blender is adding extra frames in there with the footage for some reason. I have no idea why. Maybe it's just user error on my part. Who knows? But um, anyway, so we want to look at these and see if any of them are sliding around. Sometimes if you uh, go back and forth between the frames, you'll see that the footage is moving, but the trackers are staying still and then they catch up later and that makes it a little bit janky. The very first thing you want to do is come back over here and adjust your, see if you can find where the problem lies 
in your graph and either disable them or retrack or delete the ones that are highest. All of the stuff that we've already done. But for now, we've got our track, so we want to add some deliciousness to this. So if I come over here and click uh, this, Shift S, cursor to selected, and then we're going to add in a cube. And we're going to scale that cube down. But this is just for demonstration purposes here. Um, you can see that doesn't do anything. Back to frame one with our cube selected, come over to the constraints, add object constraint. And instead of camera solver, we're going to add an object solver. And then we're just going to select our head for our object and our camera as the camera. And you can see, oh, it's disappeared. Well, it hasn't really disappeared. It just moved it. And I don't know why that happens, but you can solve that real easy by just clicking set inverse and it's back where you placed it. So now we press play and you can see, oh, that is pretty cool. That tracks right along with the head. And of course, we can always still come over here and resize the square, put it more like on my head, like a block head. <laughs> yeah, so, so something like that. Grab and move that back a little bit. Yeah, and scale that on the Z. There we go, a true block head. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. So basically this is exactly what we're gonna do, but we're gonna do it with an image. So if you're liking what you see so far, please consider supporting me by going over to Gumroad and purchasing the full course Zombie Face. Uh, it's a starter pack here. Uh, it's a pre-order, so pre-order at $15, which is half off $30 for now. Um, but it includes a whole bunch of different things. We're going to depth camera tracking. You get a skull. I've modeled a skull for you to use in your 3D object environment. You fit it to your head and to your face and you can paint it on and it will create negative spaces um, so you have like eye sockets and stuff it's really cool there's also an occlusion mask there that I'll include and I'll teach you how to make an occlusion mask um, to fit your own face um, we also got a moving jaw here, so uh, uh, I'll teach you how to rig up that jaw to where it moves with your mouth. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of extras too, 2D masking, um, cutting out uh, holes in your head, putting uh, clean plates behind there, making brains, I'll show you how to do all this, color grading your skin, making it more of a decayed look like a zombie, and even um, matching the shadows of your original contour of your face and casting that on to your zombie face. Uh, so all of that is 50% off now. Again, pre-order only. Uh, right now, the creation of the course will depend on how many people are interested and how many pre-orders I receive. The deadline is... October 29th, which is two weeks, two weeks from today. Well, two weeks from a couple days ago. But yes, please consider supporting me and hopefully I will see you over there.